Now we're going to turn to the Word of God just now to the little book of the prophet Micah. The little book of the prophet Micah. You'll find the book of Micah between the book of Psalms and the end of your Old Testament. The book of the prophet Micah. And we're coming to chapter number 6, please. Now, just take your time and find the place. It's not just as easy as found as Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. But if you come to the book of Psalms, move forward to the end of the Old Testament, and you'll come then to the little book of the prophet Micah. And we're in Micah chapter 6. I hope everybody's found the place. Okay. Micah chapter 6, verse number 1. Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. I want you to notice in that verse, God hadn't a controversy with his enemies. God had a controversy with his people. I wonder today, has God got a controversy with his church? When you think of all the things that's going on within the church today, I'm sure God has a controversy with many today within the church. In verse number 3, O oh, my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed thee out of the house of servants. And I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now what Balak king of Moab consulted, and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord? and bow myself before the high God. Shall I, be, shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? And we end our reading there this morning, and we know that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his own precious truth. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number 3, Ecclesiastes, chapter number 3, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes 3 that provokes a very convicting thought. Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, there's a verse in which there's a wee text that we would do well to give it serious consideration. What does Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 15 say? What's the wee text there that should create a convicting thought? 
that should give you and I something to really consider this morning. Ecclesiastes 3.15. What does it say? This is what it says. God requireth that which is past. And mind you, that should be a word that should trouble every one of us, both saved and unsaved. God requireth that which is past. For those of you this morning in this meeting that's not saved, and if you die unsaved, in the book of the Revelation chapter 20, we find the place where you'll stand to give an account. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, sorry, ver chapter 20, verse 11, you read these words of the Apostle John. What does the Apostle John say? And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Verse 12, this is what he says. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead was judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. What does verse 13 say? And the sea gave up the dead which was in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which was in them. And they were judged, it says, Every man according to his works. And for those this morning in this meeting that's not saved, God has a word for you. God will require from you which is past. If you appear at the judgment of the great white throne, for someday you'll stand there if you die unsaved. You'll stand before God, and the books will be opened, and you'll be judged what's written in those books. You say to me, George, what will be written in the books about me? I'll tell you what will be written in the books about you. What will be written in the books about you will be the times you heard the gospel. What will be written in those books, friends, will be every time that God the Holy Spirit strove and spoke to your heart. And what will be written in the books, friends, will be those times when Christ was brought before you, and, friend, you saw him crucified, and you turned your back on him. And not only that, friend, what will be written in the books will be your sins. And unsaved, friend, now listen to me. You will be required from God at the judgment of the great white throne. It will be required from you as to why you obeyed not the gospel. It will be required from you, unsaved friend, when you stand at the judgment of the great white throne, why you turn your back on Christ. It will be required from you, unsaved friend, this morning, as you stand before the judgment of the great white throne, Every time you turn your back on Christ, it'll be required of you as to what you did with His Son, God's Son, as you lived on this earth. Listen to your unsaved friend. Listen to me. God will require that which was past concerning you. 
Do you know what God said to us through his word on Thursday night? At our Bible study. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Do you know what Peter says? It'll be better for those who never knew the way of righteousness. It'll be better for those who never knew the way of salvation than for those who didn't know it when they stand there. Because of the judgment of the great white throne, if you die unsaved, love, if you die unsaved, sir, you'll stand at the judgment of the great white throne and God will require and there'll be no escape in it. Listen. At the great white throne, there'll be no exceptions because the dead will be small and great. At the judgment of the great white throne, there'll be no excuses because the books will be opened and there'll be in black and white as to why you're there. In the judgment of the great white throne, friend, there'll be no escape. And can I plead with your heart and can I plead with your soul if you turn this morning to Revelation 20 and verse number, verse number 12, there you can see where you'll be one day. You'll see yourself there. But can I plead with your heart and plead with your soul this morning under the power of God? Please, friend, please, sir, repent of your sin and get saved before it's too late. God will require that which is past if you're going there. And us Christians, we're not getting off either. Because God will require that which is past concerning you. And God will require that which is past concerning me. Because there's a judgment for you, child of God. And there's a judgment for me. And there's no getting out of it. And there's no escape. And where do you find this? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. What does 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 say? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And every true born again believer will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And you'll say to yourself, I will now, George, what will happen for me there? Well, I'll tell you what will happen. Uh, Romans 12, 14, verse 12. Do you know what it says? Every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. When a person dies now to go to heaven to be with Christ, of course that's happened. But when the Lord comes at the rapture, when he comes to the air, then the church is raptured, and the immediate thing after the rapture, then in heaven takes place the judgment seat of Christ. And listen, Christian brother, and listen, Christian sister, whether you're young or whether you're old, God will require that which was passed as to what you've done in your body and what you've done for him, whether it be good or whether it be bad. And you know what the Bible teaches us? When we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, some of us will suffer loss. And for all how we have lived our lives down here, it will it'll all be tried by fire. And child of God, God will require from you and God will require from me as we stand at the judgment seat of Christ all that we have done in our bodies from the day we were saved. And there'll be no big preachers there that day. And there'll be no self-importance and there'll be no pompous Feelings, every one of us will stand trembling because we'll be judged not according to our sins. Thank God they're covered at Calvary, but we will be judged as how we lived our lives and we'll be judged according to our services. God will require that which was passed on, safe friends, so it's better to get saved now before you appear there. And child of God, listen to me. God will require from you and he'll require from me that which is past. Now, I know that's all future tense, but God wants to speak to us this morning in the present tense. 
And the text is found in verse number 8. Here's the text. What doth the Lord require of thee? And child of God, I want to first of all focus on that. Because that's the focus of the text this morning. What does the Lord require of thee? It's not what the pastor requires at all. It's not what man requires. What doth the Lord require of thee? One of my greatest joys is reading the autobiographies of great men of God. Wesley and Whitfield, reading about the autobiographies of men like Moody and Spurgeon, men like Jonathan Edwards, Charles Finney, men like W.P. Nicholson, Billy Sunday. Do you know, every time I read them autobiographies, there's something that stands out, you know. There's something that, that unites those men. Something that stands out. And what stands out to them men? That each of them men were mightily marked with power and with blessing in their lives, I and in their ministries. And each one of those men, and others too, and let me tell you, women missionaries, I'm putting them in along with them. What was it that marked? What was it that gave them the power? What was it that gave them the blessing? What was it that made them unique? I'll tell you what it was. It marked every one of them. Each one of them had a fear of God. And each one of them had this burden. What was it the Lord required? John Wesley was in a corner of a field one day and he got down on his knees behind a stone hedge. He saw Whitfield, George Whitfield, saying his ministry had been mightily blessed of God and Wesley was wondering what was wrong with him. He was preaching the same way as George Whitfield, and he was down on his knees all day, praying and pleading with God. Two men were walking down past, and Wesley never saw them, and they never saw him. And the two of them were talking. They must have been disputing something. John Wesley kept himself down, and he kept himself hid. And one man said to the other man, he says, listen, it's not you, it's not me, it's not you, it's me, he says. That's it, Father. It's not you, it's me. And John Wesley, God spoke through those two men to John Wesley. And that's the lesson John Wesley learned. God spoke to him and says, John Wesley, it's not you at all, it's me. John Wesley walked down that field. And he suddenly realized, listen, it's not all down to what I can do. It's all down to God. And there's something else John Wesley was touched by, and it was this. It's not all what I can do. And it's not all what God can do either. It's the kind of person that I am before God. And that hit Wesley. It's what I am before God. Tell me this, child of God, this morning, brother in Christ, sister in Christ, let's just pause for a wee moment. Have you ever thought of that? What you are this morning before God. You know what the Lord said to me this week? 
He says, George, you're focusing too much on what you're doing. And you're not focusing enough on the person that you should be. And that's to me. And child of God, this morning, sometimes we have the priorities all wrong. The Lord's not requiring what we can do. He's requiring us to the person that we should be. It's what we are in His sight. Our talents might make our names known. Our gifts might make us popular. But it's our character this morning, it's our person this morning that will determine what others will associate with it. What doth the Lord require of thee? Nineteenth century English clergyman, Anglican clergyman, preached from this very text. A member of his congregation owned a big newspaper company. What doth the Lord require of thee? And this man, as he sat in the pew listening to this godly clergyman, he was an Anglican clergyman, and you'll get men of God anywhere. And this Anglican clergyman was a mighty man of God. He challenged his, his congregation. Have you ever considered what God requires of you this morning? what God requires of you in your family life. What God requires of you in your personal life. What God requires of you in your business life. This man went home troubled. You see, this man published adverts. And he had this advert in every week of a brewery. That week, that man went to his clergyman and says, you know, what you spoke on Sunday morning troubled me. He says, why, how have I troubled you? He says, you know, God's requiring something of me that's very difficult. Why, what's difficult? He says, I was reading the book of Proverbs, chapter 20 and verse number 1. And it says in Proverbs 20, verse number 1, that wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. He that is deceived is thereby is a fool. And he says, do you know what God has spoken to me? God says to me, I shouldn't be advertising alcohol in my papers anymore. And mind you, he says, mind you, they're the best customers that I have. They're always paying. He says, I can't advertise that anymore. The clergyman says, well, maybe this is what God is requiring of you this morning. You know what that business newspaper man did? Christian man. He rang the brewery and says, I'm sorry, but I can't, I can't, I can't afford to advertise anymore. He says, I can't as a Christian. The brewery man said to him, listen, I, uh, I, we admire your your, your convictions, but listen, we'll pay you double. We'll pay you double if you can. If he even advertises in this world, we'll pay you double. No, he says, I can't. He says, I can't now. I hate to lose your business. You're the best customer I've ever had, but I can't advertise alcohol anymore. And that man, friend, closed the door on the best businessman that I ever, ever had. He closed the door on them. Many years later, that brewery man that he'd done business with came to him. He says, you know who I am? He says, I do indeed. He says, ever since the day you closed the door on me, but that advertising drink, you know what I realized? I realized God must be real concerning the stand that you took. He says, I want to talk to you about all of this. What about this God that you talk about? And that man says, I'll tell you what you'll do. You'll come with me to church. Will you come with me to church on Sunday night? The man took him to church. He didn't take him to his own church. I'll tell you where he took him to. He took him to the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. 
And the pastor there that night preached on the great text, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And that man that had a brewery friend got saved that night and sold the business up about a month later. You know, friend, that's true. And there's a pub in Castle Caulfield that was known as Wells' as Pub, and I've been in it many a time before I was saved. Remember one night going to it at a, at a dance after a band prayed, and the lifted eyes went to get home here and I went home and left me in all by standing. Wells is the man's name. And he got saved at a mission that was conducted by the Reverend Sam Workman. And the next night after he got saved, the next morning the shutters went down. No more drink was sold. And he gave his license away. And about two years ago, I was speaking in Coke Baptist Church at a, at a senior citizens meeting, and your man Wells was there singing. And I happened to introduce him, and I said, you know, there's a time this man used to sell me drink. What doth the Lord require of thee? Dear child of God this morning, that's an answer that we need to get right this morning. What doth the Lord require of thee? Look at the verse quickly. The foundation of the text is there. What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly? Not to be walking about dressed like your hand in a big Bible under your arm and your face on you like buttermilk. Not at all. To do justly. To live right before God, I and before others. What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly? You see, that's the color of true Christian character. You see the background of this passage? The background of this passage, you know what it's all about? It's about the people of God. About the people of God who had forgotten about their relationship with the Lord. I believe that's what's wrong with a lot of Christians today. We forgot about our relationship with the Lord. And did you notice about the people of God in Micah chapter 6? They forgot about their relationship with God and who God is, but they didn't forget their rituals because they still came with their rams and they still came with their oil and they still came with this. And they still came with that. And they still came with the other. Ah, but they didn't forget their rituals, but they forgot their relationship. Remember what the Lord Jesus had to say. The Lord Jesus had to say, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart, their heart is far from me. Wonder this morning is, would the Lord Jesus say that about you, sister, this morning? Would he say that about you, brother? Tell me this, would he say that about me? We can come this morning to Kilkeel Baptist Tabernacle and we can sing like thrushes. I am looked apart. But our hearts are nowhere near to be found near him. Listen, child of God, what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly? You can't be a Christian and live like a hook. You can't be a Christian on a Sunday and live like the devil the rest of the week. What does the Lord require of thee to do justly? Providing for honest things, providing things honest in the sight of all men and in the sight of the Lord. You know what it means? It means to be upright. Isaiah 26 and 7 says, The way of the just is uprightness. Thou, mo thou must most upright dost weigh the path of the just. Listen, friend, to do justly means you're doing justly with a tax man. To do justly is to draw a true reflection of Christ. J means you're justified. U means you're upright. S means you're sanctified. Ah, but three, T, T, T means you're truthful. And T means you're trustful. Tell me this, brother, sister. Are you marked as a truthful person this morning? 
Brother or sister, are you marked as somebody that can be trusted? What doth the Lord require of thee? Never you mind George McConnell. What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly? Look at the framework of the text. And to love mercy, not to preach it, but to provide it. There's a lot of Levites about today. Remember the story of the Samaritan, the good Samaritan, and, the, and, 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 and this man was lying down in the ground. And the pompous, pious Levite, he come along, he looked down and walked away on the other side. And the priest did the same. But who came? Who showed him mercy? Who showed him kindness? It was the Samaritan, the very man that that man lying on the ground would have detested. Detested. You see the man, the men, the two men that passed by that poor crater lying on the road there. Do you know who, who passed them by? Those were the men that that man would have worshipped. Those were the men that man looked up to. And the men that that man looked up to was the men that passed him by. And the poor Samaritan that he would have despised and rejected was the man that showed him kindness, was the man that showed him mercy. Too many Christians lack in mercy rather than love it. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What does Proverbs 11, verse 17 say? You know what Proverbs 11, 17 says? The merciful man doeth good to his own soul. I haven't time to tell you the story today. Maybe sometime again. I'll go ahead very quickly. A young man by the name of Desmond Doss joined the American Marines, but he refused to take a rifle or a gun to shoot anybody. They laughed at him to scorn, they mocked him. But Desmond Doss went on and he argued his point that he wanted to serve his country with no gun. And they enlisted him in the medical corps. Desmond Doss was sent to a place in the midst of the hottest battle, a place called Hacksaw Ridge, where they were facing the viciousness of the Japanese. Many of his comrades were badly injured. Many of them were murdered, butchered. They were butchered. And the whole lot of his platoon went back over the edge, and Desmond Doss was lying on his own in the midst of it all. He heard a wounded soldier crying and he made himself a rope and he binded him up and, and got him and, and put him over the edge and brought him down to safety. And Desmond Doss lying in the middle of all of that says, Lord, give me one more, give me one more. And he heard another man crying and he went over and helped him and brought him and got him down safely over to the other edge. And my friends, listen, Desmond Doss done that 75 times. And even when he heard a Japanese soldier crying out in pain, he went and he helped him and bandaged him and got him over, over into safety. Now, Desmond Doss wasn't responsible for what happened to him at the other side, but Desmond Dawson showed him, showed him mercy. And he was awarded one of the top gallantry medals in the American Army Corps. We're to show mercy this morning to those that don't like us as well as to those who do like us. For that's what the Lord requires of us. Quickly, the footsteps of the text this morning, and to walk humbly with thy God. Do you know what that means originally? It means this, humble thyself to walk properly with God. That's what that means. If you want to walk properly with God, you'll have to humble yourself to do so. A proud person cannot walk with God. He may think or he, she may think they are walking with God, but they're not. Ah, oh, no, friends. Do you see that text? What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God? Listen, this is unfinished. Here's the lesson. Only a spirit-filled person can accomplish that. But this is what the Lord requires of you, and this is what the Lord requires of me today.
May we just not learn it, but live it. So that God's name will be glorified. May God bless his word to our hearts this morning. Our closing hymn.